Hey, Facebook friends and Pup Theology, welcome to another edition of Online Pup Theology. You know, as we get used to living life in our homes and uh, sheltering in place, uh, we decided to take Pup Theology online, just like many other places are doing right now. And we're glad that you're here. Um, we are joined today with some really good friends of mine. We have uh, Molly Cox from SA2020, my co-host Beck McNeil. And uh, pretty soon I'm going to introduce uh, Brady Dieter uh, from Ranch House, who's going to sing us a song. But before we begin, uh, I, you know, Pup Theology, we talk about faith, we talk about our community, we talk about creating the common good. And uh, when we really talk about faith in the next few weeks, uh, I really want to think about faith as faith in each other. Like we said a few weeks ago, I really believe in our community is, is very strong. We have a strong community that can support one another in these times. And uh, I have faith in you uh, and to, to, to have compassion and serve each other in great ways. So when we think about faith, we don't always have to think about it in the way of theology or a deity. We can think about it having faith in each other. So as we talk with great community leaders here in San Antonio and what's going on uh, with the COVID crisis. Uh, I, I have great faith in, in this community. So uh, I'm gonna do something that I've never done at Pup Theology and that is start uh, with a prayer. Uh, at Pup Theology, we don't uh, really uh, subscribe to a certain religion or faith uh, tradition necessarily. We, we're open to all uh, different views and different brews. All perspectives matter. We've had clergy from almost every faith tradition come in the last four years. Uh, but during this crisis, uh, I'm going to say this prayer. And uh, whether you have faith or um, you're, you're a non-believer in the sense that uh, you don't really have a specific deity, that is okay. We really want this prayer to to go out to everyone. So uh, let us pray at this time. And I'm going to read this uh, right now. We pray right now for peace in our hearts. We pray that we may take advantage of the world slowing down and focus on the things that really matter, our families, our community, and the world that we live in. May we live, lay aside the longing of the world we created to be busy, to do all the things possible. May we keep ourselves from others to reduce harm, to share our love by our actions of self-isolating and to prevent the spread of disease. May we remember who are merely inconvenienced. Remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who are losing our margin money in the economic market, remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for quarantine at home, remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. Let us yet find ways to be loving and brace to our neighbor. Our fears are real. We fear loss of income and jobs. We fear for our own health and safety and the health and safety of our loved ones. We fear that we, what the future might bring. Help us let go of the fear as force that holds us back, but help us to acknowledge our fear, to sit with it like a troubled friend. Help us to give ourselves compassion and grace that you showed us. Help us to hold on to the hope that in this life, a new life that may emerge from these circumstances we face now. Guide us into ways of peace for all of our hearts. Lastly, we pray for all those who are sick and suffering due to the virus. We pray for all first responders and healthcare professionals risking their lives to help others. We pray for those who are anxious or isolated. We pray for our elected officials and government across the globe, our nation, our state, and in this city. We pray for our homeless and migrant neighbors and vulnerable and marginalized people. And we pray for our businesses and employees we, who lost their job and face great uncertainty. Lastly, we pray for our world and our interconnectedness in it, recognizing both suffering and solutions are without borders. Amen. Guys, thanks for that. And I hope that prayer uh, spoke to you in some way. Right now, I want to bring uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Brady Dieter, Dieter from Ranch House. Uh, he is going to come on and sing us a song. And we just thought we'd just start off Pup Theology uh, light and easy with this song from Brady. Brady, thanks for being here. Yeah, you bet. Uh, these are strange times. Um, I've got, I've got a, a, 
a ton of musician friends on, on Facebook and I've been watching people do live streaming for the last two weeks. So I think everybody's getting kind of used to seeing people play in their living rooms. Um, Gavin asked me to, to play a song that was uh, maybe a little bit um, reflecting on life. And um, I'd like to think most of the songs I do are like that, but I, I was going to do one called Around the Sun uh, from my first album. And then I started to think about a new song that I wrote um, very early this year before I ever heard of the coronavirus. And I started to think that this song could be uh, framed in, in that lens. It, it talks about um, it talks about when, when in times uh, your life you felt uh, a strong urge that you were supposed to change something about your life, and it was almost as if that feeling was being spoken to you. And um, in the song, I I I was raised uh, in a sort of a loose idea of some sort of ancestor worship that when your ancestors pass on, they're like guardian angels and they, and they watch over you and maybe they whisper in your ear and, and give you hints on when to change and when to do certain things. Um, so anyway, this song's called talking to ghost and uh, uh, some of it's sort of appropriate to this time. And it's certainly appropriate to um, reflecting on life in general. So uh and uh, one other thing I'm just going to add, because I just read this before, we're talking about how coronavirus is getting more and more real all the time and the numbers are getting bigger and we're seeing people that we care about um, being affected and sometimes passing away. I just read that Ad Adam Schlesinger from uh, the band Fountains of Wang um, passed away today from coronavirus. Uh, Fountains of Wang was uh, a kind of a indie pop band when I was growing up that I really enjoyed. Um, so uh, my thoughts are with anybody who has family that are dealing with this. And I think we're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of this and it's a scary time, but we're lucky that we have um, this way to communicate with each other and not be fully isolated. Anyway, I've, I've talked enough. Here's the song. It's called talking to ghosts. Hear the ghost stomping in the attic. I can hear them shaking their chains. I guess they're up there dancing, long time dead, somehow wide awake. They want to communicate. I've been working long days and nights, carving a name in a tombstone. I got a wild look in my eye from spending too much time alone. Something never came or something's gone. I've been thinking about taking my own life, maybe turn it into something special. Never really want to roll the dice. That's why I'm standing over this threshold that I dug in a cemetery. Life gets kind of scary when there's nowhere left to go. It's time for change, but it's hard. Feels like we gotta give up all we've gained so far And money is not the only reason to march We all got that marching band inside our hearts And beauty, it always leaves a mark Like a wildfire out there in the dark I'm talking to my ghost I'm trying to find the feeling I'm talking to my ghost Now I'm taken by a spirit
I've been holding on to three leaf clover. I've been going out to restaurants, and I've been feeling pretty lucky lately. I've been interviewing debutantes. Nothing seems to match my sweet imagination. But I get so caught up in the smoke, I nearly lost my destination. Destiny moves towards the unknown. I'd rather settle down for calm and peace. Never really had too much to show. I'm hoping these ghosts can help me see. What do they want from me? It's time for change, but it's hard. Feels like we gotta give up all we've gained so far. And ambition is sort of common these days. It gives order to your life like chains to a slave. And integrity, I guess it's kind of rare. So quit acting like you don't care. I'm talking to my ghost. I'm trying to find a feeling. I'm talking to my ghost. Now I'm taken by a spirit. So Gavin is on mute. Um, I don't know if he realizes that or not. So I'm going to let him unmute himself and say all that lovely stuff again. There you go. I was on mute listening to Brady. Brady, thanks for coming uh, online for us. Uh, next time we're in person at the Friendly Spot, we'd love to have you uh, live with us. So That sounds great. Thank you very much. It's Appreciate an awesome it. song. And and guys, because we're not at the Friendly Spot, I am wearing my Friendly Spot t-shirt right here, Defend Friends. And I think that's a really good slogan uh, for us in this time, that we're going to defend one another uh, through our social practicing and all the service that we're all about here in San Antonio. Uh, right now, uh, I'm going to bring on my co-host, amazing co-host, Becca McNeil. Uh, she is a reporter for Christianity Today, a former reporter here in San Antonio, also covers education on her own blog. So Becca, thanks for joining us. Hi, happy to be here as always. Great, uh, Becca, let's uh, introduce our next guest and talk about what we'll be talking about tonight and uh, we'll manage comments. And uh, I'll be managing comments tonight. Uh, we'll be talking, we can see them over there. Uh, if you have any questions for, for Becca or Molly Cox coming up, uh, please post those questions in our comments below and we will get to those questions um, uh, when we can. So all Becca, right, you, you bring it on. All right, thanks Gavin. I'm gonna bring Molly on and switch y'all out. <laughs> Hello, Molly. Hi, you're, are you ready? <laughs> you're like producer, interviewer. You're doing all the things tonight. Yeah. Sound, sound technician. Yeah, except, yeah. <laughs> I'm like the last person in the entire world who has any business doing this. So. <laughs> Prepare for it all to come crashing down. Right. It's a new it. world. It's a new world. It's it's a new, we're all learning about our new skills. It like, is. It's true. I'm super good at staying home, turns out. I I don't have a problem. I'm fine with it. This is great. I'm legit fine. I feel um, like I'm compelled also. Oh. Hey, I know that y'all normally do this at the friendly spot as well. So I put a koozie on my adult beverage. And because here at Pub Theology, we're all about supporting local eateries. Yes. Tonight, my, oh, here we go. This oh. pizza is from Barbara. Barbara. Nice. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, wow. So don't forget to order takeout from all of our wonderful local restaurants. Yeah. I, tip, tip, I, tip, tip. Yeah, please tip. Uh, earlier today, I um, shotgun. Um, house roasters delivers free. If you're in San Antonio, they will deliver coffee to you, like coffee beans. And I had gotten, I was gifted a shotgun wow. mug. So I had a mug with shotgun and I had shotgun coffee in it. And it was almost like being- And then you shotgunned it. And then I shot, I literally shotgunned it. Oh, I I no, I hope not. Cause I that don't. sounds terrible. It's a hot coffee. Just yeah, like, it sounds like an injury. Yeah, it's re injury yeah. waiting to happen. <laughs> Molly, thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah. We so we have this planned before 
coronavirus. We did. We were yeah. going to do it the normal pub theology way. But yep. now that we have coronavirus mm -hmm. to bring us all together, um, it's even better that you're the one who's with us. Oh. Um, because I feel like you're the right person to um, kind of tell us, give us a little snapshot of where San Antonio is. Um, we had some people qualified um, to talk about like the virus itself. And yeah, um, yeah, no, no, please don't. Please don't. If you're not a medical professional, don't tell people about everything you know that you got off, you know, Twitter. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, I'm a medical professional because I've read all the articles. I read everyone's angry, hot takes <laughs> about. Although I just to interrupt and I don't mean to fully take us off track, but we did post a we podcast. Track here. Uh, it's true. We did post a podcast today. Um, we SA2020 in partnership with KLRN does a podcast called The Story Goes. We had been on hiatus because we didn't know what to do with it and decided to start recording it in our homes and posted the very first one back. Um, and it was with uh, Barbara Taylor, who's a doctor. Um, yes. She has an MS in epidemiology. She's an associate professor at UT Health and um, UT Health San Antonio on infectious diseases. So I, she's That's I, an she expert. To. And she, I, I can't, I, I want to say that if you get a chance, it's called The Story Goes. You can download it on any podcast app that you listen to. Um, what's amazing about what she did was not only scientifically explain to us what we're going through, right? Um, I felt weirdly comforted after speaking to her, right? Like uh -huh. she was sort of just like get, getting rid of misinformation. It's, yes. It is very serious. She wanted yes. certainly to impart that, but she... I felt good knowing that this person is in our city, working with other amazing people in our city, le like legitimately trying to figure out how we move forward. And I felt strangely comforted that my friend is a smart doctor. Yeah, it, yeah. it's the difference between talking to experts and- um, Twitter. Yeah, Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Um, as my prognosticators, as my yeah. grumpy grandpa would call them pre-Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, is how you feel afterwards. When you talk to yes. an expert, you feel like, okay, this is scary, but they're, they're not the ones, like if somebody's setting you on alarm for no reason, yeah, it's not helpful. No. And so I think that I kind of judge like, do, do I feel like I have a better grasp on the situation or does it feel bigger and more out of control and scarier than I could ever imagine. Yes, and that's how I feel like I was taking in, we are taking in so much information right now. Oh about, my gosh, yes. About a, a thing that we, most of us don't know anything about. No. Um, you know, and just speaking to her and sort of, it felt like, oh, all right, that I should be paying attention to. You. I love that she very was like, it is not social distancing, it is physical distancing. You may still be social, but you must be physically apart. And I was like, yes. yes. <laughs> made me feel, feel so healthier good. already. I was like, yes, I can't wait to be physically apart from everybody. <laughs> well, not so much. I know. I'm fine. That's, yeah. The other night I looked at my husband after. So I have small children. And uh -huh. it's our lives in some ways have gotten infinitely more chaotic because they're home all the time. Um, right now they're um, playing outdoors. But it's um, so in some sense, infinitely more chaotic. And in another sense, we have nothing else to do. Yeah. So once we get through the day, we just kind of like lay back and go, okay. We, we, right, yeah, I'm right. And I said, I can deal with all the events being canceled. <laughs> yeah. I, in my like, life. There's like so many things, right? I, um, the, there's like such a weird sense of, um, uh, scariness, right? There's like, I don't know what, what, what is happening. We don't even know what's happening tomorrow. Yeah. Um, there's things closing down and people obviously losing their job and um, their jobs and uh, events being canceled. And, you know, we can uh, certainly, we had a lot of events scheduled over the course of the next three months. We'll, we'll see a, a shortfall in revenue because of it. Right. Oh. Um, and, and I'm like, and there's also something weird about this time that's making us do exactly what you were just talking about like slow down and sort of be and with well, our families and 
Yeah. yeah. And reevaluate what's possible. I'm hearing a lot of people talk about, yeah. and we kind of got onto this the other day, reevaluating, like, I mean, everybody's seen the meme at this point of like, so I guess now we know which emails could have been, or meetings could have been emails. Yes. But it's also, now we know which um, evictions could have waited, mm -hmm. which uh, stoppages could have waited. Now we know um, just how much we could afford to give and that kind of thing. And oh, I think it's like, oh, everyone can telecommute, it appears, right? Like, yeah, oh, that person that had to be in the office didn't have to. Didn't have to be. That work trip that you were like, no, no, we better take the trip. You know, you didn't. It. You didn't. No. And um, I think that has implications for carbon emissions. It has implications for our family life. It has a ton of implications. And in, I think the coming months, obviously, we'll have lots of explorations of what to keep and what to try to return to the old normal. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the sake of the economy and all that. Um, and I think we're getting a really up close look, which I want to talk about a little later, at um, equity and inequity. And this has certainly thrown a bright light on inequities that were pre existing, um, created new ones in some ways, but also in dealing with these, I'm wondering how many solutions we're gonna find for things that were already existing, like the digital divide. Mm -hmm. As we try to solve it out of necessity, because now it's not a, I don't think the internet was really a nice to have in the first place, but you know, whatever. Um, but you know, like SAISD is saying, well, we had a three year plan and now it's a three week plan. Right. And I'm going, well, that has some long-term positive implications. Yes. At so, the same time. Um, yeah. That if you're going to use that internet mm -hmm. to for a new job, maybe that's not <laughs> a happy thing for your family. So right. there's a lot of the the net gain and loss is just still so far out. It is, yeah. It's a, I appreciate you sort of bringing that up. It's literally exactly what we do, right? At SA 2020, is sort of pay attention to programs and policies and efforts and understand where those could be shifted to better meet community need. Um, yeah. uh, and yet you're like bringing up exactly, right? The things that we've been launching recently uh, that we've been doing for quite some time, but sort of ramped up over the course of the last couple of weeks is sort of highlighting where community need is how we could be pivoting very quickly to um, uh, meet that community need. And it also, I think, is you're exactly right, shining a bright light. Like before we would say like, I mean, it's fine, right? Because you can go to the library and go on, right? Like we would basically- Where all the letters are wrapped up. <laughs> right, it's like we would sort of schluff things off, right? And now we're like, there is no library to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, so how does a person get online and work? And how does a person um, uh, go to, um, if you can't get out of your home to get to your to internet, how do you work? How do you go on to school, how, anything at this point? How are you finding out what's going on in our yeah. community if everything is shifting online? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've talked about like the, um, there's, the, the school districts, again, I, my world is school districts. So the school districts that are announcing, uh, sending out Facebook posts and social media posts to tell people where to come pick up their devices. Yes. It's like, well, a phone call. But this is when another one of those things is like, we got a phone call from SAISD and my kids are in school there and we're fine, but they called our school, called every family and said, what do you need? Do you need groceries? Do you need Wi-Fi? Do you need a laptop? What's let's, like they did a needs assessment. And another school, I saw data from another school where they just called until they got an answer. You know, they didn't call and say contact attempted. Yeah. And I think we're going to learn a lot about outreach. I agree. Which is another one of y'all's strong suits. I, I mean, it's what we try to do well. Um, I think that we are seeing um, something in our community now that is like, hey, um, checkbox um, engagement, not gonna work now. Um, yeah. uh, doing it one way and assuming everybody can see it, 
it's not going to work now, right? So yeah. how are we sort of? And um, wasn't working in the past. It wasn't working either, right? In the past, uh, and now it's sort of brought to stark reality. I mean, we're just yeah. fully living in it right now. Yeah. So we have a question. Um, how do you uh, from Mario Bravo on the front? Hi Mario. End, hi Mario. On the front end of the pandemic, you look like you look a little bit alarmist. You look a little bit like Chicken Little. The sky is falling, said the Ohio Department of Health Director Amy Acton at a briefing this month. At the end of the pandemic, you didn't do enough. My question is, how do you get your community to do more without being alarmist? Ugh. But I think I Love think that. that getting those experts out front, and they don't necessarily like to be out front because they're like science people, and they're like, if I would have wanted to have a microphone in my face all the time, I would not have gone into a lab job. Right. But um, I mean, I there's sometimes I wish like my fellow journalists and I could just keep reporting on all the other things that are still happening in Steel Real. Yeah. And just have a special channel totally dedicated to like the CDC all the time, constantly with yeah. only doctors. Yeah, I it's like they're the only ones talking. Yeah, I, Mario sort of ta for me, right? It's I know we talked a little bit earlier about talking to Barbara Taylor on the podcast, but I um because information is coming at us so quickly now, it's like uh, I realize that there are obviously reasons behind having medium, right? So that somebody could post something. Obviously, we want people to be able to post things that they want to share, and we're also seeing that like anyone can post on medium. So I'm going to call, I deem myself an expert and I will post on the, and then people will read it. Right. I really do think that there is something to be said and I appreciate sort of this idea and it, it's right. We've seen the, the, the statement going around that if we, if we do this right, it's going to feel like, Hey, we did yeah. this for nothing. Right? right. Like we all sat at home and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we do it wrong, people will die, um, yeah. and I, right? Like, yeah. so, hey, how about we do it right? And maybe it feels like we overreacted. I mean, maybe, I'm just, maybe, I'd rather feel like I overreacted. But I, when I was talking to Barbara Taylor yesterday, she said something to me that sort of resonated in such a fantastic way. And it was the idea, she was talking about droplets. And she said, right, when you're speaking, if I sneeze or if I spit at all, droplets come out that's where the disease is. And in this case, it hits a surface from what we can tell, right? And then you pick it up. And she's like, just stay six feet away from people. I, the yeah. Right? She just like, I, I really can't tell you enough. Listening to Barbara, it made me think, oh, we are being inundated with information that's making me feel um, scared. And I, and we should be scared. This is serious. But secondarily to that is we are, there are medical professionals doing something about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and our job as a community, particularly a community that has a community vision that says we are all responsible for our collective well being. It's yes. like y'all wrote that. I didn't, y'all did. Um, and it says to us, right, that this is the perfect time for us to be living that every day, all day. How, what would it look like if we were saying, I'm staying home? for you, I'm staying home for your kids, I'm staying home for parents, I'm staying home because I don't, I could be asymptomatic and yeah. I don't wanna give it to anyone. We um, started referring to all children as asymptomatic carriers. That's right, yeah, they could just be walking around with it and we don't know. Um, so I'm like, bombs. I'll just stay home, I'm, I, I, yeah. can, I can. And right? at the same time, I think there's, there are other reality. I look, I mean, that great article that's going around about HEB right now in Texas Monthly. If you're going to read something besides so CDC update, that article is phenomenal. Um, they're prepared so they don't have to panic. And so yeah. I think there's also something to saying, okay, who's the expert? get them in a place to do their thing. Like they had a guy, they have a disaster preparedness guy. Yeah. So there wasn't a bunch of people running around saying, well, I just feel like people are really going to want more grape juice. I just feel like they are, you know, <laughs> right. they, they had a guy going, Nope. Talk to, 
It feels good to me. Grape juice. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think that's what's going to get us through this. Right. Um, which is how I feel about a lot of like the, or somebody going, just close them, just close the stores, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Uh, the gig economy will take over and people will start to grow gardens. That's what's going to happen. Um, you know, nobody yeah. did that because they have a guy. And so a lot of it is that our, it's, you have to pivot your attention away from your super cute, sweet aunt who just wants to help. Yeah. And so is going to send you like a hundred articles about how to stay safe and what to drink to keep the virus away and pivot to the experts. And so yeah. economically as well, because now, and that's where you guys, so speaking of pivoting to experts, I feel like when I read y'all's, um, y'all have your, we is greater than me. Um, mm. I'm reading it off your shirt and it's like cut off. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We is greater than me yeah. uh, campaign. And tell us, I want you to show us and tell us a little bit about those resources because I got um, a good sense of it's going to be okay from looking at that. Oh, I, I got, I got a sense of the so severity good. of it and the seriousness of it because of how many jobs and I want you to talk about all that. Mm -hmm. But I also got a sense of, okay, we are mobilizing and trying to do something about it. And the opportunity is going to be there for a long time for us to continue to do something. Yeah. So I'm going to, um, yeah, if you'll share screens and all that stuff, I would really like to, um, yeah, your thoughts. for sure. Oh, real quick. Let's address a few more. Um, oh yeah. So I don't know if all of the ISDs, uh, Sandra has a question about are all of the ISDs calling? I don't know. Um, and even if they say they are, it's parents at individual schools will tell you how earnest that effort is. Unfortunately, there's no way to know, um, you know, how it was our son's preschool teacher who called. So that at that point, you're getting down to like teachers having to make the repeated dials and stuff. So I don't yeah. know, but um, I, man, that's a good story to track. Um, and Lindsay, <laughs> if by grape yeah. juice, you mean wine. Yeah, I, I would imagine wine sales. <laughs> Now's the time to invest in wine. If, and also, uh, just I, another plug, since we can, um, I, uh, if you're looking for like a local company too, right? High Street Wine Company. Yeah. Uh, at the Pearl. Like they were one of the first ones to literally move everything online. They became an online store. They delivered directly to your car. They rehired all their wait staff as like tech support. Um, awesome. so they could keep everybody employed and they are like selling all the wine online and it just makes me so happy that they, and they do deliveries too. Yay. Um, so when I'm loving all the cocktail kits, like you can buy at Barbaro, I was tempted to, but I was going on air and the last thing we need is our already not tech savvy technician drinking. I, um, yeah. It's, it's not a good thing. Um, yeah, you're not in charge of who we can see in here. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I'm also, but I, you're the idea of like somebody being able to. I'm. I know that we're going to talk about very serious policies and programs and efforts that are truly need to be rethought in order to disrupt the systems that we've generated, um, and created ourselves. But there's also some things that I'm like, okay, it. Why can't we have stuff delivered to my? Why can't I have someone bring me a cocktail to my door? Like why? Yeah. Why can't I? That you I, can now. I know. I'm like, you can like, have the best. I was looking at Barbara's menu as I was ordering my dinner and you can get like a cocktail kit. So it's like a bottle of liquor. Oh, they're like selling off their, their stuff. I am ready. Um, okay. Um, so Molly, tell us a little bit about y'all's the everything that you guys have launched today. And then I want to pivot to longer term thinking. I want to hear you talk about what needs to shift. Sure. I, that's so important to me. I, I think it's probably important because we find very frequently that people don't really like, they're like, yeah, we know SA 2020, but we don't know what they do every day. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to quickly sort of yeah. say that out loud. Uh, SA 2020 um, is the nonprofit organization that drives progress towards San Antonio's community vision. Okay, break um, that down for us. <laughs> right. So the community vision originally started under Julian Castro as a public process where 
nearly 6,000 people came together and wrote out the future of the city. Like, where do we want to go as a community? Arguably one of the most successful community engagement processes. In other cities, we literally hand that community vision then over to the mayor or a, or a city department. Um, and it um, lovingly goes there to die, right? Because whoever comes in next is like, nah, we're not doing that vision. We're going to do my vision, even though it wasn't Julian's vision, right? It was mm -hmm. um, the community's vision. Um, he did something very smart as the mayor. And he said, I want to start a nonprofit and I want them to be responsible and I want them to be objective. And I want them to say things sometimes that we don't want to hear. Um, and we do that. So as an organization, um, we do three things. One, we transparently report on the progress towards that community vision. We track 62 indicators and report them out. We now disaggregate many of those indicators by race and gender and place, again, to show need because um, aggregate numbers sometimes mask um, can mask uh, dispar disparities, uh, particularly as it relates to race. Um, Secondly, we work very hard at um, increasing sort of spheres of influence by aligning multi-sector organizations to the community vision. So um, a Bank of America or um, any nonprofit, right, can come to us and say, hey, are the work that we're doing at a micro level, is it moving the needle on the macro? Like, are we aligned? Um, and we celebrate those organizations as partners. And the final thing that we do, which you've sort of hinted at a couple of times, right, um, is uh, engage and activate the public. Um, we very, because of this bird's eye view that we have of the indicators and the organizations, multi-sector organizations we work with, we are able then to sort of tell a more complete story of San Antonio's progress or non-progress. And we believe that both of those things have to happen simultaneously, right? That we should be highlighting and uh, celebrating when something's going really, really well. And we should absolutely be saying out loud when something's not. Um, yeah. Give uh, us an example. Give me one from each column. Yeah, so we can tell you, um, right, that uh, San Antonio is one of the top cities for college educated millennial growth, right? Young people with college degrees are coming to our city. Um, and that's amazing. Um, they're coming here because of our arts. We That's the what the surveys are telling us, right? Uh, they're coming here because of affordability. And immediately when we saw that, we thought, interesting, because one in three people in San Antonio can't afford where they live, hmm. right? So the fact that we've got people coming from out of town to come here um, because of our affordability, at the same time, yeah. we live in a community where one in three people can't afford their homes. Yeah. Um, one of the most income segregated communities in in uh, the United States and to us, right, that those two things, college educated millennials are not coming to San Antonio because they threw a dart at a map. We right. collectively, multi-sector collaboration made our city a place for people to come to. We have jobs here. We have uh, affordable homes for some, right? We are a city that people want to come to and that didn't happen by happenstance. And as far as we're concerned, if we can make our city one of the top cities for college educated millennial growth, we absolutely together can figure out how to have everyone afford their homes. Um, we, we believe that that's possible. I agree. And I'm, when I think about a concerted effort um, it took to make uh, the city on the rise and mm -hmm. that uh, the persona, I'm thinking of all the different organizations and um, marketing and media that came and kind of rallied around this idea that we should be there is a there's a financial incentive for that because those educated millennials come and pay money. I am I really want to see who's going to rise up and champion um, this idea of equity and affordability, true affordability, true um, coming together. And I who, think who's going to champion that? What 
what financial incentive is there for yeah, all of it? I think that you're speaking very specifically and I, let me be very clear. I'm not the expert um, in uh, our office around this work. That's clearly uh, Kieran uh, Baines who leads our um, partnerships and strategies. Uh, the, the challenge for us consistently is that we keep hearing that equity is a zero sum game that we have to take from someone to give to someone else, right? That you, I'm gonna take something from you so that this person can have, uh, that we can create equity, right? And we can show you again and again and again through data um, that that's not true. For example, when we say things like, hey, we need to recruit talent because we don't have the talent here, what that becomes is this either or space. And we mm -hmm. think it's, we know it's a yes and conversation. Yes, we can recruit and we have to be paying attention to our local workforce yeah. um, because the jobs exist and the people here exist, right? Um, we have been paying attention to high school graduation rates because those um, that was one of the first goals in the um, community vision we hit. Uh, we started at about 74%. Um, we're up over that, uh, it's a much higher, it's closer to 87, 88% graduation rate now, 89%. Um, the And then we flatline. So everything mm -hmm. after high school has flatlined. Now, right. what we say consistently is, well, then what does that mean? How do we have the conversation where we say, we now know that 65% of jobs require something beyond high school. That's a certificate. It's a two-year degree, four-year degree, something beyond high school. And we also know, because we have a talent dividend that shows us uh, that if we were to increase um, college degrees, that's bachelor's degrees or higher, by 1%, or about 14,000 degrees, uh, in the San Antonio, $0.4 billion economic return to our community. So to say, right, well, you're, ta you're taking one thing to give to another, we, we're showing you when we give people the opportunity and access, um, it is helpful to everyone in a community. $1.4 billion economic return to help to, for 14,000 college degrees. And you're seeing it happen right now, right? Like Alamo colleges went back through um, their lists of people who owed dollars to them, $500 mm -hmm. or less, and found 9,000 people who were capable of coming back to school but had a hold for something as simple as like a library fine, yeah. right? And what would it look like to remove that barrier um, of do the math, 500 times 9,000, and you're going to see a $1.4 billion economic return, right? It it makes no sense to us. So I think that the championing is going to have to come from the community um, as yeah. it has, right? Um, I think industry leaders are going to have to start paying attention to homegrown talent. I think um, are, and they are, um, right? More and more. Uh, you can, we've been having conversations with the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. They fully understand, right, that our local workforce is as important to economic development as recruiting new businesses to our community. Um, and that's what we want. Um, I think it's, it is a matter of like equity isn't necessarily in a in a growing economy. If the economy is growing, then yes, equity can be achieved without taking away anything. But, and I talk about this a lot in education, advantage mm -hmm. is a zero sum game. You can, you can't all have an advantage. And so I think that a lot of times we have to question what we really want in our economic growth. And that's just a hard conversation we have to have with businesses of like, yes, the quickest, fastest way for you to grow is to import your talent, you know, and you will get rich. But it's if you're truly interested in, you know, it's it doesn't necessarily take away anything to invest in um, local high schools, local community colleges and whatnot. But you do have to decide 
um, I'm not going to hoard. Right. Yeah. And, and I, that, I, I just, I think that like, there's this, there's the selling point of we all rise together. Um, and I think that from my vantage point, it's also just challenging the community to say, you have to be, do your decisions that you're making reflect that that's really what you want. Yeah. I th you're like literally our job every day is to remind people that there is a community vision. There is an agenda that the community wrote out. And if you're waking up every day um, and not thinking about how the work you're doing is impacting your community, you're failing San Antonio's community vision. Yeah. Um, and I, that's our job. Like our job is literally to say, oh, does that policy actually get us closer to the community vision? Or does um, that just fatten up your, your profit margin? Right. Um, and it, it is our, that's what we thrive on is being able to yeah. say like, we can also help you if you don't know if what you're doing is really ultimately moving us closer to educational opportunity for everyone, no matter their zip code, um, hmm. then talk to us. We're happy to help you figure it out. That's our job. Um, we want everybody to be waving that San Antonio community vision in front of everyone's face because quite frankly we are all part of the systems we seek to change um yeah. no matter who you it's part of like how we function as an organization it doesn't matter if you lead a company or your frontline employee to us you all have such vast knowledge and experience you can disrupt the system at any point um if you if you can't if you choose to yeah i think yeah and i um so just some fun information for the people watching. Also, reminder to ask questions. I think, Gavin, do you still have a question? Was there a question from a listener that you, you're, you're muted, by the way. You're Gavin, muted. Gavin is every grandpa right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just trying to respect the, the feedback. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, we, it's really uh, not a question anymore. It's kind of more of a statement from Raymond Duran. He, he runs one of the interfaith groups here in town. Uh, he says Bear County and San Antonio has 18% poverty rate, which is a higher percentage of children that live in poverty. Uh, what you, so I guess the question we can form from Raymond's comment is, um, as this poverty rate will probably increase uh, uh, in San Antonio, what can we do? But also, how is SA 2020 addressing uh, this issue? Obviously, we all know the statistics. So how is SA 2020 addressing the poverty rate uh, here in San Antonio? Thanks, yeah. Gavin. Thanks, Gavin. Um, and thanks, Ramon. I think um, there's a couple of things, right? We get this question a lot, like, what are you doing about? And then fill, right, fill in the blank. Um, the, we are doing stuff. And I don't mean we, I mean, as a community, we, there are multiple agencies working towards, I, we joke all the time in the office, like, stop talking about poverty as though we don't know how, why it exists, or that yeah. we don't know how to change it. We know how yeah. to change it. We just need to do it, right? Things like um, the Alamo College's promise, UTSA promise, the amazing work that's coming out of a and San Antonio with the Southside School Districts Aspire. Um, we know, right, that education leads to spaces where you are capable, we, we are giving spaces for access to the jobs that exist today in San Antonio, yeah. that we don't need to import anyone, they exist today. We also know that poverty is systemic. And if we are not talking about generational systemic poverty in a way that me makes sense, real, like mm -hmm. real sense, if we're not being serious about it, then we're, why are we even having conversations to begin with? I, you know, if you look on our dashboard, you'll see the poverty rate. Um, it's one of the indicators we track under family well-being. And then we recently, literally this week, I think Tuesday, launched city council profiles um, that are disaggregating some of our indicators by council district. We know where poverty is most prevalent. Um, and we yeah. know that it's not by itself, right? Um, education is tied to poverty. Uh, economic development is tied to poverty. There are so many, voting is tied to poverty, right? Like there are so many things that we ask people to sort of consider as they're creating programs and policies, if you are not um, thinking about how all of these things are interrelated, then you're really failing um, 
the ultimate space, quite frankly, the vision itself. I'm getting up to turn on a light. Yeah, it's, it's like the sun is setting on us, and I feel like we're both getting more. Um, I like turned the, it. Our filters are on. Yeah. I feel like I'm in Juno filter on Instagram. <laughs> I'm, I was, I'm trying to like do away with the dark circles that are under my eyes. <laughs> Look, oh, oh, there's light. Oh, there she is. Um, well, let's real quick pivot to those two new resources. Um, sure. I kind of feel like we we flipped the order, um, but that's great. Hi, that's I'm, Lucy. This is Lucy. Hi, Lucy. She's going to just stare at me. It, she, uh, she doesn't. That's so much she's pressure. Very, she's very sweet. Yeah. My three-year-old does that. Um, so Same, same, same. <laughs> also three. So Oh, it's an age thing. Yeah, it for is. For sure. Not a species thing. Um, so, well, actually let's camp out on this a little bit longer because so for everybody in the, um, listening space out there, I, uh, learned more about SA 2020. I was one of those people who kind of always had the question of what do you guys do? Like, what's your, what does your day look like? Mm -hmm. And then when I understood what about the community vision and tracking and looking at all of the data. Um, as a journalist, I started going, oh my gosh, this is like a, a gold mine. Cause, um, and we've talked about this, but, I, and then I went to a national conference for other solutions journalists, um, people looking at solutions to big problems, climate, poverty, income inequality, gun violence, education, um, some other things. And I, I was talking to some folks and I just started telling them about SA 2020 and they were like, Oh man, to have access to something like that in our community. And I kind of explained how the community vision came about and how this year you guys are like times a millioning it. And, uh, which we'll talk about that and give everybody a chance to do that. Um, and I said, because community engagement is a really big question for journalists and people trying to tell if they're telling the stories that matter to San Antonio or their, to their community and looking at, are we reporting on the actual communities that we have or are we reporting on where our subscribers are? Or do we have subscribers there because we've continued to report on it? Or are we only reporting on places that we know and are comfortable? Mm -hmm. Like those are, those are questions journalists are asking across the country. I mean, the it, and it shows up in every beat in every way. And so there's a, to have a community vision that's been collected from across the city, not from um, the usual, like, let's just be frank, like just not from the North side, um, creates this map for the stories that we should be telling and decentering people who I think get let off the hook on equity because they don't see themselves as part of the whole, they're in the middle of it. And so it feels balanced. Mm -hmm. But when you realize that you're not the middle of it, you're kind of part of this other thing. And there's a lot of weight. There's a lot of economic weight. There's a lot of healthcare weight. Like you've got stuff and everybody else doesn't have stuff. I, so my question is, what's the storytelling strategy? Hmm. Who's talking to you guys? Who's telling these good stories? Not, I mean, yeah, the good news stories about this is an amazing thing that's happening, but also the stories about our segregation and our inequity in a way that says, um, this is just as much a concern for our community as the construction on Highway 281 North. Yeah. Um... That's a great question. I think uh, we tell a lot. We're obviously not journalists on uh, uh, on purpose, right? Um, and I think secondarily to that, which is why we ultimately started a podcast with KLRN, right? Um, because we were like, "Hey, the stories are not getting out in full ways." And I'm so there's a couple of things in our report and on our website. We have a very specific call to action. Uh, for individuals, for public officials and elected officials, for journalists also, to tell more complete stories. And I think the challenge consistently um, 
and I will say there's a reporter over at the Express News who basically opened the book, the report when it came out in January. We release our report every year in January. And every year we're like, here are 5,000 stories to tell. That, <laughs> that's what I showed this group of people at, at this summit. And they were just like, you could like just basically make this your beat. You could just take this book and go find the stories. And then you have that web of like, here's who's, here's the problem. Here's who's solving it. Here's how they connect. I don't, I don't know if you yeah. have access to that, but if you could show that, I mean, yeah. it's just incredible. I will. I can, I'll show up. The, in fact, here, let's see if I can prove, let me show if this will work. I'm going to try to share the screen. I think I figured out how to let you. Well, let me see. Share screen. Now yeah. we're all grandmas. Oh, look. We're everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, this is the screen I want to share. And I'm going to pull up. Um, oh, there. Oh, is that working? That's it. That's the one. So this is the what we call the SA 2020 ecosystem. And I realize that it seems ridiculous. But the reason that I'm sharing it is because it absolutely shows you. So poverty, for example, falls in family well-being. I'm isolating right now family well-being. This is, I can obviously scroll in and, right, we can get closer to it, et cetera. But I want to show you, these are our 160 plus multi-sector partners. And these are the organizations, all of these little tiny circles that are connected to family well-being that are currently working in some form or fashion in philanthropic giving and the programs that they're producing and policies that they're creating um, in helping get us closer to the vision we wanted for family well-being. Um, the link itself, um, I'm certain somebody. Oh yeah, your team is, your team is totally on it. They're, they're so it smart um, that you can go to it and see it. Um, and you can, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, there you go. Um, you can go to it and look at it and see if one of, your favorite organizations that you donate to is on there and where are they moving the needle? You can say, hey, I am very serious about education and I wanna know who's doing what in education. So there's a fantastic sort of way to interact with the information and to see the organizations that are really paying attention. Um, but to your point about um, telling stories and journalism, I think part of the fr frustration for us is um, when the, original visioning process was completed, uh, it was called SA 2020. Mm -hmm. So there was a conflation for a while. Wait a minute, if we cover SA 2020, then we can't cover SA 2020. And we're like, you, anyone can cover the San Antonio's community vision, anyone. Yeah. You pick up that report and it is there for you to use. Yeah. Secondly to that, hey, we're a resource to you as an organization. We can tell you the organizations that are just doing such amazing work um, and not just um, one or two we can give you hundreds of organizations that are doing things um, creating efforts making things happen that are so important to getting us closer to the vision we seek and it's not like because i mentioned earlier we do community engagement very seriously it's not like we said, hey, let's do the community vision in 2010 and then we've never revisited it, right? right. Like we've been um, doing community engagement for nearly a decade, having people tell us, hey, our partners telling us like this isn't right or this doesn't, we're not capturing fully uh, food insecurity. No problem, let's add food insecurity and start tracking it this year. So well, and sometimes when you start going down a rabbit hole, you start realizing, oh, that's why we don't, we aren't internet connected, you yes. know? Oh, that's why X, Y, Z. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, like, ah, um, yes, yes. Well, and for me, like, yeah, it's, I just, I think that like, I'm an optimist in a lot of things. Um, the economic segregation of our city is one thing where I have a hard time being an optimist because I do think it's going to take um, some soul searching and some will on a lot of parts. And I, I think that's the one area where you go, okay, yes, equity is not a zero sum game, but advantage is. And like, it feels good to live in certain parts of the city 
and it feels good for those areas to flourish. And there doesn't seem to be, the sky is the limit on how much flourishing feels good. You know, yeah. it feels, the sky is the limit on how many cool resources your school can have. Yes. I think that there's a conversation to be had. And I, I think that our, our work uh, introduces us to um, people across our community, uh, organizations across our community who are doing amazing work. And I think our, the challenge that we consistently see is that we turn this into an individual problem, uh. um, that we make this individual. Uh, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? Right. And I'm like, yeah, except that for we, we some people don't have boots. <laughs> yeah, because we took them. Because we took, we literally put signs on the door and said, you're not allowed into this boot store, right? Like, yeah. And, I, and we're going to put all the boot stores in this neighborhood. One, and we're not going to give you an access to get there. Like, there's yeah. no road and we won't show you the directions. Yeah. So the challenge, right, is that we consistently, and I mean this all the time, there's slippages always into the individual, always. Right, right. Uh, if we talk about voting, oh, I, do you know the amount of articles that I've read where it's like, oh man, if they would just, those young millennials, if they just show up to vote, you know? If the like, Latinos would go vote. If they would just vote. And I'm like, you, you think that it's because they are just like, I don't care? But, like, <laughs> <laughs> We've literally created systems to make it impossible for somebody to do it. Yeah. With the amount of things that you have to, when we talk systems, right, and we're saying in order to vote, you have to interact with local government, you have to interact with the internet, because how do you know who's running? You have to interact with transportation and yeah. sidewalks, right? You have to interact with your employer. Can you get yeah. some time off? The education, because what am I going to do with my kid, right? Like there mm -hmm. are literally so many systems that you have to be in and i think the challenge is we live in a community where sometimes the loudest are the people who are like individual responsibility and we can't i i, I can only show you you <laughs> as it has nothing to do with that i hold I'll on show say that one more you. time because it, it's happened. on a website I, um, I, it's like, I can't, SA 2020 literally points you to the data and says, look at it. It's not individual. It's right. not, it's systematic. It's systemic constantly. We can show it to you by city council district. We can show it to you by race. We can show it to you by gender. We can show it to you by aggregate, always systems, always. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I think Pivot. And, I do want to. I do yeah. want to pivot to the good news. <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to think of like a graceful segue, but I don't think there is one, because I also feel like there's. Um, it's not about individuals pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, but in sometimes it is about individuals saying, "Okay, I'm not going to double down on my advantage or my hoarding or my." It's. I mean, I was interviewing a guy about education the other day, and he. This is the first time it's happened, but I'm sure it won't be the last. He said, look, it's like it's like the people in the store with the toilet paper. They're, they don't, uh, he said, white folks don't need the extra toilet paper, but they're going to take the extra toilet paper and they're going to create scarcity so that everybody else is fighting over the leftover to toilet paper. And he said, like educational opportunity is that toilet paper. There was plenty to go around until you started hoarding it. And then you create this scary scarcity where there's, you got to get into the right colleges and you got to get into the right whatever. And until you got people talking about where are you going to send your kid to kindergarten mm -hmm. so that they can feed up into the high schools where the colleges recruit. And, I, and it just never ends. And it's because of this scarcity that we create when we hoard. Well, it's the conversation, right? We say this all the time at SA 2020, and it's clearly co-opted, but um, right, it's this uh, its this idea that we always say there's like infinite uh, need and finite resources. Mm -hmm. And we're like, no, 
there's not infinite need. We know no. what the need is. Yeah, that's we know exactly where to pivot the resources. It's kind of like Diego Bernal's saying of like, we can't throw money in it at it. Well, let's try. Yeah, <laughs> like we've never tried. Try it. Just try. Just throw yeah. some money at it. But I also like I think the challenge, right, is that we are legitimately trying to disrupt systems also requires us to consistently be thinking about is the choice we're making right now the best choice why are we doing this? why are we doing it this way what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve what's the data tell us right like i think we are so quickly moving we move all the time into plans first plans first right we're like oh there's a problem here's let's plan and i'm like wait what hold why is that a problem what do the outcomes what is what are we trying to achieve here what's the data tell us then we move right yeah. don't make a plan until you know why you're doing something to begin with and i think to your point right what what we need to be better at is understanding is the thing that i'm doing today ultimately creating impact in the community in which i live mm -hmm. um, and if it's not why am i doing it and then if your answer is because it feels good to me Mm -hmm. That's a different conversation. Yeah. And on that note, as far as needs and plans and whatnot, this is our pivot to the we is greater than me uh, stuff that you guys have. Because I really do want to show everybody um, the the needs of the nonprofit sector and how oh, people sure. are moving to do that. Because And talk to us a little bit about the importance of the nonprofit sector in this time. You've identified these people who are acting in the best interest of the community. You've identified um, the important impacts that they have. And now they're at risk. Yeah. Because when economics get tight, nonprofits feel it really quickly. Um, people start worrying about how much they can give. They start, mm -hmm. a lot of these folks live and die on events and that's now jeopardized. Um, I feel bad now for saying I wish all the events were canceled. I don't. I love that everyone else is going to them. Yes. Um, right. I won't ask for refunds, but I might not show up. Um, <laughs> now that I know. That's okay. That's okay. Now that I know. Um, but hold on. Um, I want to pivot to talk to us about the nonprofits. Yeah. The, the role that they play and what we're doing to um help them and hold on gavin wants to say something real quick sure uh, i that's just a great conversation i want i'm willing to finish this now oh okay yeah um yeah so sa 2020 has um uh, about 150 nonprofit partners who have um intentionally aligned their work to the san antonio community vision um, and the challenge in nonprofit sectors always is um, uh, figuring out sort of a nonprofit sectors sit in such a weird space, right? They're delivering this public service, this public good, um, uh, but are not and are asked to be run like a business um, yeah. and then not treated at all like businesses. Like we had to beg, right, to to be included in anything that has to do with business. Um, right now is, I think I can tell you that out of the, we did a survey of our partners last year, 144 nonprofit organizations, which is about 3% of the organizations in Bear County. That's totally overwhelming to me, by the way. Yes, there's like 5,000 nonprofits in Bear County opening, closing every day. Some of them are volunteer based. Some of them have multiple sure. hundreds of employees. Out of the 144 organizations that are our partners, there are over 11,000 employees. Uh, it's a $1.2 billion revenue stream. Like that's how much, just in 144, that's on par, let me just say, that's on par with target industries that we talk about for economic development. On par with advanced manufacturing, on par with IT technology, right? Like it's on par with, our target industries, what you're seeing in the nonprofit sector. Tomorrow, um, if all of those nonprofits had to shut their doors because we couldn't keep them open because of giving, because we that's also very important to nonprofit organizations, right? Um, we would have 11,000 more people in need, right? Um, so the challenge today for nonprofits is one, they are obviously, the, the need has increased, so they're doing more with the same or less 
um, than they had before because they're trying to meet community need. And then secondarily to that, they're also trying to keep doors open to keep people staffed um, and on uh, and in their jobs. Um, so there's a twofold. So we have been pushing very seriously um, that if you are a person who is capable of giving to nonprofits and you are capable and you've already got relationships with arts organizations or with um, uh, uh, the YMCA or right if you have if you have a, a relationship with a nonprofit we are asking you to continue that relationship continue giving to youth code jam right continue giving to your favorite community theater um, that's important um, and at the same time of course it's important to support the food bank and haven for hope where need is rising exponentially um, but both of those things can happen simultaneously. And what we consistently do as funders, and I don't just mean us individually, I mean large funders, is we don't, um, we immediately show uh, community need is food, let's move over to food, right? So we like shift very quickly to food. Um, and then we're like, yes, but when this is over, um, that theater that you used to give to will be closed and we won't have a theater to go to anymore, right? Um, and this will end, <laughs> right? We know that at some point we go back to probably a new normal, but a normal nonetheless. Um, and the organizations that spoke to your heart uh, prior to COVID-19 will speak to, I promise they'll speak to your heart after um, and to keep them sort of going. So we did, we created a resource um, that shows, uh, I'm going to take you to sort of the main page. If I can, let me see if I can share the screen um, again. So let's share. Uh, the, this is our COVID-19 resource page, um, which allows you to sort of see multiple things. Um, our, these are the local government resources. We is greater than me is something you're talking about. Because we're talking about nonprofit partner needs, I'm going to go there first. So this actually takes you to um, our nonprofit partners and shows you where the need is the greatest. And when you see general operations, it typically is going to tell you that an organization has lost revenue and is desperate for maintaining uh, operations, right? So it's just general operations. And then in these spaces, it's more of the like, hey, we're, we're doing more food, we're doing more childcare, we're doing more healthcare, et cetera. You can even scroll down So let's go there. All of these organizations, there's $440,000 right now in need, in operations, in education. And you can scroll on each and it tells you exactly who is needing what. And if you click it, so let's do Boys and Girls Clubs. If you click it, it shoots you out to the space where you can donate to them. Um, and it gives you an opportunity then, right, to... Um, give directly that shoots you over to boys and girls clubs uh, big give relief page the big give relief is an individual donor platform it uh, typically we would do a um, big give day uh, I'll come back uh, and stop sharing we would do a big give day it's a one day online process and we all try to raise money and it's like a super feel good opportunity to give ten dollars to one of your favorite organizations or more and obviously this COVID-19 happened and the nonprofit council um, shifted um, to uh, make the platform available for any nonprofit that was needing dollars right now. So it's an opportunity for you to find the organization that you love and give to them directly. I, I think they're close to $500,000 now, um, which is amazing. So I had to sing on that one. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and that was, we were talking earlier about one of the things that made me, we were talking about how talking to experts makes you feel better. Cause I started to get like anxiety about that, about like, yeah. oh my gosh, how are boys and girls club gonna weather this? And, and you're showing us, you're showing us the real need. And then you have this other great page that shows yeah. you that, what people are doing. Yeah. And I think that's that kind of like realism. Like, let me, yeah, let me show you, you're talking about, I'm going to go back and share the screen. This is so fancy right now. Um, I'm going to share and show you this one. It's sharing, yes. And um, 
responsive funding, again, this is our COVID-19 resource page. So if you go to the responsive funding page, you can see open funding opportunities. So our nonprofit partners can see where they might be able to apply for something. Um, and then underneath, you start to see some committed dollars from major funders, right? So remember, the Big Give, this one here, the Big Give Relief Fund is now closer to 500,000, and those are typically going to be individual donors. So individuals are giving over like fi nearly $500,000 to various organizations. Here, we're looking at sort of the larger buckets, right? So Frost Bank, for example, committed a thousand a uh, million dollars in San Antonio alone for emergency operating support. And you can see exactly where they're giving. Um, if you want to know where USAA has been, and it shows you right here, USAA, where USAA has been committing funds, where millions of dollars is where we're at now, right? HEB is doing something around um, research uh, and food, and I, I cannot stress enough, right? They we're looking at 1.8 million dollars right now in um, food relief, right? So, yeah, I, I understand sort of what you're talking about. This idea that it feels um, like it's infinite need and finite resources, and we're like, hey, it's not. We again and again and again, we're showing that people are capable of stepping up and really shifting the way that our systems operate. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke earlier about um, uh, we uh, is greater than me. Um, we had started a campaign this year. We This was from our luncheon. It was prior to COVID-19 taking over and truly within, I'm gonna pull that up as well, um, within, um, two or three days from working from home. So we launched this uh, nearly two weeks ago. Um, that's sharing, yes. So mm -hmm. we at greater.org, again, you can find that on our COVID, I'm gonna just keep showing you, the COVID-19 page has everything that you need there. It shows you the Story Goes podcast, if you want a presentation or a workshop, if you want to see city council districts broken up by indicators, that's there as well. We is Greater Than Me is an opportunity for us to celebrate um, individuals and organizations who have truly stepped up in such an amazing way. We got this one today, Press of Transportation Coalition um, and Via Trans. They are basically delivering um, curbside grocery pickup and also delivering, they'll pick uh, adults and individuals with disabilities, seniors um, also to take them for curbside pickup, right? You can look at categories. So if you want to see, hey, what are companies doing or what are nonprofits doing, you can look at it that way. And you can even submit something um, if you are interested in doing that. Um, if you are in need of, um, as Becca mentioned earlier, if you are in need of seeing people and organizations just doing the thing, go to that website. Um, okay, and on that, we have a, a question, a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, Corazon Ministry says, we would love to work with you. Um, we have another question about um, how long, how do, how do you become an SA 2020 nonprofit partner? Yeah. How long does the process take? Um, it takes 10 years, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, we, All these people signed up in 2009. It'll be fine. We'll get there. Um, uh, we have a partner process. So there's an application process, and um, you can find that on our website. Literally, if you go to, although oh, I, uh, your team, like, are, up really like, yeah, they're probably already there. That one right there. there. Um, if you sign up to be a partner, we ask you to fill out an application. Um, it is not. Um, it's not like a, hey, join us and you become a partner. We want to know what are you doing to help San Antonio get closer to its community vision. Um, but uh, we would rather you be a partner than not be a partner. Um, so we want to work with you. We want you to we want to help you figure out if it's not if if what you put in your application maybe isn't up to um, the up to par, like you don't track your outcomes at all, or you've never disaggregated data, or you don't even know what we're saying when we say those things. We don't want you to go away empty handed. We would be happy to um, sort of figure it out. Our, our capacity is um, a little bit harder <laughs> um, right now. 
um, because we're running so quickly, but uh, we did have very clear deadlines for partnership. And then when COVID-19 happened, we were like, start sending in your applications if that's the case. And we would be happy to make that happen faster. Um, and we know that's pro we knew that when we started posting about uh, nonprofit um, needs and responsive funding and city council profiles that we would see more nonprofits say we want in, we want you to be in. We want more people to align their work to San Antonio's community vision. That's awesome. Um, I, one of the fun things watching the comments is all the people just saying hi. Um, I think the fun part about having Molly is the like crowd of wonderful people who follow her around. Um, one of them, Jessica Weaver, I oh. is with, I know. Hi, Jessica with Communities and Schools. <laughs> um, I, so I've been, I'm working on a story about Communities and Schools. And one of the things they're saying, I think that illustrates everything we've been talking about. I mean, that's a very, when I think of organizations that are aligned to, to lift up our community, that's a big one. They're um, they, they do yeah. Their <laughs> yeah, I should hope so. Um, but they, <laughs> hi Jessica. Um, she was, they were, Jessica was telling me that the same needs are still happening. So a lot of, one of the big conversations around COVID is the acute need of COVID, very specific, masks, ventilators, hospital space, stay in your houses, don't get each other sick, more hand washing. Um, but there's also um, the same needs that have always been going on. Um, people are still having a hard time paying their rent. People that, and they were before. Yeah. And so those communities and schools is still doing the same work. Now it's harder to yeah. do because they have to figure out how to do it remotely. Yep. They have to figure out and mm. the need is getting bigger because of the economic stuff. I think that articulating like the, the role of those critical partners, how it's gotten harder and larger at the same time should motivate us all to kind of go look between our couch cushions where we hide our hundred dollar bills. I, that's and, where I, that's where I hide them. I mean, I don't, I, I hide Lucy's <laughs> <laughs> whenever she she's hoarding her bills in the in the couch. In the couch. Um, like Not. now's the time to like break the bank, break the piggy bank because the better they can do their job throughout this, it's kind of like flattening that other curve. Yeah, because there's going to be another curve of need, and the better they can do their jobs. Now, the I kind of think about like every family who gets a bag of food and they don't have to spend. 80 bucks or however much on that bag of food, that's 80 bucks more that they'll have toward rent in May, you know? Yeah. And like you start yeah. to think about that and building their capacity um, has, has a, another curve flattening effects. So we're all talking about flattening curves now. Yeah. It's all, um, that's a brand new phrase that we use now all the time, apparently. Yeah. It's, it, it's going to be one of those phrases that doesn't mean anything in a while. Yeah. Like where you say something like, well, I was going to go out, but I'm going to try to flatten the curve. I'm like, well, COVID's over. And they're like, oh, I was talking about my drinking. I'm still just no. generally. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> right. That's not what that, curve, that's not right. what that means. Right. Um, well, what else? What um, Y'all keep asking questions for Molly. We've got her for um, a few more minutes. And Molly, what else? Are, what haven't we talked about that we need to talk about? I think we need to talk about um, community engagement and what happens after 2020. Um, oh, yeah, because y'all are done this year, right? Yeah, everybody, I, you know, I, I'm saying this and I, I say it and it, I, we used to make a joke that in the year 2020, San Antonio would implode. Oh, um, a bad then, joke. I'm, I'm like, now it's, I feel so bad that we used to make that joke. Um, yeah, I, there was somehow we got this timeline put on us and then it was like, oh, so your nonprofit will close and the seven people that work for you are going to all go home. Seven women, by the way, that work for us. Um, well, I'll just go home. And I'm like, no, we're, huh? We're like, trying not to create more unemployed people. No. So um, I also, hi, Patty Rossa and hi, Rocio, and hello. Um, oh, hi, everybody. I'm like, there you are. Um, I, um, yeah, we very intentionally 
developed a community engagement strategy that we would utilize the entirety of the year 2020 to reaffirm and strengthen San Antonio's community vision. And we would do it in a way that would allow us to get even more people um, engaged. And in fact, based on nearly um, close to 70 ambassadors and um, our partner institutions, we came up with a number and said we could get to 162,850 people to help us um, strengthen and reaffirm San Antonio's community vision to add where we feel like it's missing, to subtract where we feel like it's overkill, um, to tell us if there's things, strategies that we should be elevating more. So it's not just, hey, are we going closer or further away from the vision, but what are the things, right, that we say as a community are going to be important moving forward and how are we supporting those things, um, those efforts? Um, and we're still doing it. Uh, yeah. Oh, so yeah, put up the link, team. Um, show people where to go to be part of that because I think that um, the you've got time, you're in your house, yeah, and you should be taking no the survey. Excuse. Let's take a survey. Yeah, it's three um, questions. What do you want to see uh, improved um, or changed over the next 10 years? What do you hope is maintained or preserved over the next 10 years? And what are you doing in an effort to improve things? Yeah, so um, your team just posted the link to that. Right. Everybody definitely go in there and do that because um, I think a lot of one of the reasons that people kind of disengage is that they feel like, the community, they feel like the community wants something they don't want, you know, and it's because they weren't speaking up when the, when the time came. And I think that this is a great, the call on all of us is to make sure that our neighbors who need to be brought in to the collective work. Absolutely. Are getting the chance to have their voice heard in the shaping of it. Cause that'll make them feel more ownership. And I will say, right, we are very serious about transparent community engagement. We want you to see who's responding. What are the priorities already elevating? And if I can one last time yeah. share you can a screen. Do that as much as you want. I'm going to do one more share screen. Um, the community engagement um, process is online. Uh, and everything, we our website, which is PS, um, lovingly, uh, I would be remiss in not saying Claire Remert and her team of volunteers um, have helped us do our website for free for two years. They've just been updating and they're amazing. This one we did internally um, with one of our brand new staffers um, and our team. It shows you we've we have been engaging nearly 7,000 people. Uh, the survey link is on there. It shows you how many people have completed the survey. And then if you keep scrolling, it'll show you. These are the things that people want to see preserved right now. Culture, landmarks, green spaces, and parks. Um, and the top three things that people want to see changed. And none of this is shocking to us, right, as we've been doing this for 10 years. It'll show you all the things that are coming up so far. And it'll even give you top themes by city council district. Um, and then everybody that we've been speaking to, where the where it's all coming from and then of course the map of outreach and events as we're doing it obviously that's changed slightly um, <laughs> they're all online out, it's all online now um so yeah we would love you to share um to um put out the um uh, to do the survey and give us your feedback. We are moving very quickly into our next phase of community engagement and can't wait to roll that out. Um, but we are continuing community engagement. In fact, we just went through a conversation with a bunch of people from economic development to see if we were tracking the right things to show where we want to go as a community. Awesome. Hey, you know, Molly, I love uh, your idea of sharing, especially the, the we, is it we over me? We is greater. We is greater than me. I know, you know that, is, that is a very that is a very uh, well. It's, at least the way I see faith is a very faith based model. Uh, one of my favorite miracles of Jesus, right, is there were five thousand people. He actually probably more than five thousand people uh, because in the Bible uh, times they didn't record children or women. So there was a lot of people here listening to Jesus, and they didn't have any food, right? And they were like, what are we going to do? 
And Jesus said, hey, just uh, this, this boy came with some fish and some loaves. And he said, pass this around. And then at the very end, you know, this miracle, everybody was fed and they had all this fish and bread left over. And people really think the miracle is like some type of like voodoo magic, right? Like all of a sudden there's these fish in this bas basket that would just magically appear. Uh, I don't I don't think of it that way. I think what really happened in this moment is people started sharing, right? Like they had food with them. They had things uh, there, probably just like, you know, there were so many people there like, I'm not going to share. If I start sharing, everybody's going to want my fish, right? And we kind of talked about this with equity a little bit. But at the end, when everybody just shared within the community, there was plenty, right? And I think in this COVID-19 crisis, uh, your model, what you're promoting, especially just sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, sharing uh, with the theater next door or the stuff you've been saying, when we do that, we're going to have more than enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very important thing, uh, especially uh, in this time uh, when right now, uh, people can freak out and people can get really worried and start hoarding and, and really take it in for themselves. Uh, and I think right now we have to remember that uh, if you're a person of faith and you're watching Pup Theology right now, like equity is a, is a very good model, model that, that many faiths promote, that we don't have to be afraid of, of somebody different from us or somebody that may not have as much money as us. It's not, wh what did you, what was the illustration y'all used earlier? You were stealing, stealing from, uh, Taken from somebody else. What did you say, Mal? Uh, zero sum game or infinite need and finite resources. Yes. So all that is very important. Also, want to remind you that it's the census day today. People uh, were talking about that. Uh, Molly, how has SA twenty twenty been promoting the census, and what does this mean for a community? Yeah, we are a part of the census team. I, there's like a whole team of census people um, and we promoted that today. So if you're on our Facebook, you can see how you get it. You should by now, if you're checking your mail and you should be, cause you're potentially hopefully home. Um, you should by now have gotten your census in the mail. You can turn that around and go online and fill it out. Uh, it should take note. It's like five minutes um, and you fill it out. I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I will say, right, first of all, Bear County is actually trending very, very well in getting these census, um, the census completed, which sure. is incredibly important. A complete count is incredibly important, important to our community. When we talk about things like the food bank, right now in the middle of COVID-19, right, when we're talking about places like the food bank or United Way or Haven for Hope, the data that we receive from the census, and we can only receive that if everybody is counted, um, also gives us dollars federally and state um, uh, and helps us understand who in our community needs something. Um, so it's important that we get a complete count. So even if that means like, it's like voting, tap people, don't tap them, this is real. Um, hit them with a the thing on Facebook and make them fill the thing out. I'm just saying if three people would tell three people who would tell three people, we would just get everybody counted and we would get mil yeah. it's really literally millions of dollars back to our community uh, to help people in need and to build That's sidewalks great. and streets and, you know, those kinds of things. That's great. All right. So I have, I have one more question for Molly. This is, this is kind of one in the current news. Uh, this is Pub Theology. Uh, we have a lot of people of faith watching. A lot of communities are now, faith communities have gone online. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing that for a few weeks. And they're probably like, oh, okay, that was fun for a while. But our governor, our governor just said it's okay to meet again if we're a, a worship community. What would you tell? That, there are some great partnerships you have with faith-based communities in San Antonio. Yeah. What would you say to these, these faith groups? I, I don't know of any that are starting to do that. But yes. Hold them up, Gavin. Take it to Triple listen, X. We are the emoji right now. Okay. No. Yeah. I, I understand. I get, I get it. I, I, the, oh, can you, like, the desire to just be in a space with other people and to just share and to be in close proximity. And I, I am begging you to please listen to the podcast that we did today with Dr. Barbara Taylor, who says, no. Physical distance will help us get back together again sooner. Um, Without stay killing away each other. from each other. You, I'm, I listen to the podcast. I, I get it. 
I understand it. And if you don't have the means, I get that you might not have the means by which to do something online. I understand that. And I'm like, oh, if you're people of faith, then you know your faith is there in your home. Your faith is there with your the people inside your home. Uh, the faith is in your in your soul. Um, you don't. Your, the faith is on the your phone. You can call somebody and have faith there. Um, and I am I implore San Antonio. We are a city that said in our community vision that we are all responsible for our collective well being, and if you're in a collective, you are responsible for those people. And that also means that if you're asymptomatic and you give it to someone, you're responsible for that. And why would we want that? I mean, we could just stay, stay, stay home. Tell them Lucy, Lucy. There he goes. Listen to Lucy. Hey, well, you know, we, you know, most people of faith believe in this sacredness, right? There's some sacred traditions, there's sacred, whatever. What's more important than any tradition or liturgical practice is each other, right? Like uh, if, if you believe that we're all born in the nature of God, there's no more sacred than our lives. And so uh, when people long for some sacred tradition, remember that we are that, like we are a part of that. So don't let your um, uh, idea of what, I can't miss this, it's too sacred. Well, what's really sacred and that's what you know, we all are this this great creation, this yeah. world we live in. So, I'm also like, oh, go outside and holler at your neighbor from across the street and yeah. have that space, but with six feet between you. Or you know, for a while there, it was really in vogue for people to say like, oh, I feel God when I'm alone in the woods. Like now's the time. That's now is your time to go feel God alone in the woods. Yes. Or go commune. Or you know. You just yeah. be, I, I seriously, I am implore you. Physical distance will get the sooner we do this the more the, the better off we will be that's it that's all i can say we are all responsible for our collective well-being that's it that's awesome that's uh, our message becca do you have any final question for our our guest here before we wrap up here soon you have any more or do you have any thoughts you know we always say at, at pub theology you know we like to have a concluding remark have you molly have you ever watched the jerry springer show I unfortunately did, yes. Okay, you know, at the very end uh, at the Jerry Springer show, there's like this weird one minute like conclusion of Jerry. Yes. That's yeah. kind of like reasonable and sane. But why? What, what would be your what would be your ending conclusion here with us today? Um, if you can, support your local nonprofits, the ones that you love in your heart. Um, oh, ask why more. Ask why all the time? Why are we doing this? Why do we need this? What are we trying to achieve with it? Um, if you need a break, go to weisgreater.org because it's there. Um, you should absolutely do that. Um, and um, what? just be kind right now. Give grace and patience and kindness and everyone just do that. That's yep. I'm very eloquent drinking my <laughs> adult beverage from. That's good. Like that. hey, it's pub theology. There is pub in this thing. So <laughs> the dog um, like once in. James, uh, she's like, can I have some, please? You're underage. Great. Um, hey, Becca, is there somebody trying to join right now? Do we have anybody else? Do you look down there? Is somebody else there? No. Um, Brady. No. Brady, yeah. We're going to bring Brady in at the, sing at the sing a song at the end. But before we do that, I want to talk about, and Molly can stay with us, uh, uh, our next Pup Theology is next week, April 8th, so it's not April Fool's Day. Uh, and, and again, as April 2020 is reminding us on the comments, it's April Fool's Day is canceled, it's Census Day, right? So uh, it was hard, April, today was a hard April Fool's Day for people, not a lot of, not a lot of April Fool's joke. I don't think I heard any. I think people, that canceled. got canceled as well. Canceled. Um, uh, but next week's Pup Theology is going to be a cool one, talking about our faith-based communities uh, and how they're responding. We're bringing in author and um, pastor Max Licato from uh, Oak Hills Church. He's an amazing author, sold over 150 million books. I can't even imagine that. Um, he's been our uh, guest at Pup Theology before. Uh, he also is a contributor to Christianity Today, like Becca, and um, he's going to be joining us, and we're going to have a conversation with him and talking about fear and what we do uh, in these times and how can we use this idea of hope when there's so much uncertainty and uh, he's a great voice for that and we'll drink we'll bring in some other people like dr ann helmke 
Does Dr. Did I just say Dr. Did I just make that up? Just Ann Helmke, Pastor Ann Helmke. Uh, we're talking about sacred.org and a few things like that. So uh, that's next week, Pup Theology Online. Um, again, remember to support your local communities, your restaurants. You know, we're, we're blinging the friendly spot because they are our gracious hosts for all of these events when we're live in person. Um, so we will, uh, Molly, thank you so much. And yeah. it's, been a, it's been a blast. I, I actually was just a little employee at the TriPoint Community Center uh, when, when Molly and her team and uh, SA 2020 started uh, and they did their very first vision, community vision like meeting, where we got out, we got into these, all these tables and we discussed what we wanted to do. Um, and from those small tables, and I guess you had four or five of those uh, within that year, right? That was five, yes. Five, mm -hmm. yeah. And look, look who's come out from it. All these things that we see on your website, all the events, all the, all the nonprofits that y'all support and the data y'all collect. Uh, it's been amazing. So thank yeah. you for just that small vision that's become something great. It's amazing. And I, I, I forgot and I will get in trouble. It's our favorite talking point. And I want to say it out loud one time. Okay. San Antonio is the only large city in the entire United States of America that has a community vision written by the people who live here and call it home a separate nonprofit that holds us accountable to that vision and more than 160 multi-sector organizations aligned to that vision. No other big city has that. Becca, am I gonna get to see your children or what? Yep. Oh, I'm in. Oh yes, Becca, bring in your most famous kids on Instagram here. Hi. The boys hi. Are they just Say hi, everybody. <laughs> or wave. Should we, we take care of each other? Yeah. Why? Because it's the middle of the coronavirus. Because it's the middle of the corona. Should we take care of each other all the time? Yeah. Yeah. What's the best way to do that? Um. Is it this to share? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's that? Oh, okay. Pizza. 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 I always appreciate how kids are like, yeah, duh, we should take care of each other. I got a, I got a question for you, though. What's been your favorite part of social distancing and staying at home? What's been your favorite part of staying at home? Have you enjoyed staying at home? Yes. What's the best part? Um, getting to play with my parents. Getting to oh, play with right. my parents. Oh, wow. That's good. She's not a teenager yet. No, we social distancing happened for us at a great time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. Here. That's great. Here, you want to hear them? Here. Well, hey guys, again, thank you so much for coming on. Molly from SA 2020, uh, you do an amazing work. Um, Becca, as always, it's always good to host uh, Pup Theology with you. Uh, we are going to bring back in our friend Brady Dieter. Uh, he's going to sing us the song he was going to said he was going to sing, right? The Around the Sun song. Um, and then I'll come back and we'll conclude us out. And, um, and, and Brady, tell us a little bit and unmute yourself before you start, or you're going to be a grandpa like me. And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about um, mm. uh, where you can where you can listen to your music and, uh, and and find all that stuff. Sure, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'll start out with that question you just asked me. Yeah. So, uh, ranchhousemusic.com is a website that has information about my music, and you can find music on Bandcamp and Spotify and. Uh, basically any online application, ranch house. It's spelled in all caps, ranch backslash house. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do a song here and I want to, I want to thank you guys for the really interesting conversation that you're having. And I uh, really appreciate the work that Molly Cox does with SA 2020. Um, really amazing work. And I, I think there, there's a curve or more of a trajectory that has gone on throughout human history um, where we sort of went from uh, small, small groups of people that did not cooperate with each other. And then as history progresses, larger and larger groups of people begin to cooperate with one another. Right. And this is sort of not really a curve, it's just a trajectory. And as we move into the future, because now we're able to communicate with this information age, more and more people are going to communi communicate with each other and cooperate with each other. And I think ultimately uh, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, rapid change. And 
people have asked a lot. A lot of people have been saying, what is the silver lining of all this um, pandemic issue? And I think it's sort of another step in realizing that this is the first thing like this we've faced since we've had this information technology and we've been able to interface with each other while we're going through a really drastic issue. By the way, I have a puppy here and it's we chewing all do. On, Molly had it's one. Chewing on a horn and it's making noise. I don't know hey, what that sounds gonna, like. He's gonna be a part of your band. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, I won't go on and on about it, but um, I just feel like it's really uh, important to mention that if, if you're stuck in some sort of philosophy that um, that individuality and uh, and remaining separate from cooperation is important, particularly in your voting preferences, uh, you should just move on because we're not going that direction and you'll be left behind. And we're all going to start cooperating more. And uh, that should be your voting preference is cooperating more. And that way we can serve more people and help more people. Anyway, so here's a song about a song called Around the Sun. And it's about taking on these changes that are challenging, uh, challenging to our psychology, our philosophy. And in life uh, and in my life, uh, there's been many moments in life where it's like, wow, this is a big change what's going to happen. It's kind of scary. And then it's amazing the adaptability of human beings. But uh, this is just a song, a simple song to kind of try to capture that emotion. So uh, here we go. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Thank you so much, Gavin Rogers, for having me on your program, Pub Philosophy San Antonio. And thanks to Molly Cox and everyone for putting uh, on a, a great conversation. Here we go. As I look down on the change in leaves from the safety of this balcony of the things I have to do there are several once I get back down to ground level I My head is spinning from beginning till no end, and all anybody can say it's going to change. Change. Whoa, this could be fun. We could just ride this planet around the sun and get up at first light and ride the waves into the night. Whoa, this could be good. We could just carve our figures into the wood as we follow the path. Danger be damned as we dance in the aftermath. Wonder while I'm whisked up by a whirlwind to pick you up and put you down again. Of the things I have to do, there are many. Once I get back to the city, I ooh, I ooh. the world. Is flat no more, but I am still praying to my Lord, 
And all anybody can say It's gonna change Change Whoa, this could be fun We could just ride this planet around the sun And get up at first light Ride the waves into the night Whoa, this could be good We could just carve our figures into the wood As we follow the path Danger be damned as we dance in the aftermath Whoa, ooh, ooh. Danger be damned as we dance in the aftermath Whoa, ooh, ooh. Danger be damned as we dance in the aftermath Brady, thank you so much again. Again, you can go to ranchhousemusic.com to, to, to learn about your band. Oh my gosh, that one. This is my wild animal. <laughs> now, is, 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 where is Becca? Are you back in here? Are you still here? Is everybody yeah, still here? I'm still here. My mom is still here. Is, she, is, is Molly here or did she go? No, Molly had to go. All right, well. Guys, Brady, you can stay with us until we conclude. We'll conclude all three of us here. Um, okay. And Laura, how you doing? You can conclude with this too. There's four people here. Hey, well, guys, thank you for listening to another online version of Pub Theology. Um, you, know, you never know what we call us. We could be called philosophy, actually. That's probably a better name for us. But um, I do want to conclude with this. Uh, it's, a, it's a Bible verse from James, uh, and it says this. My brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in, and if you only pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, fine clothing and say, you sit here in the good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I think as we talk about equity and we talk about just the importance of sharing with one another, uh, we're going to have to, again, uh, come together, as Brady says, and just really focus in on each other. Even when people look different from us, from different neighborhoods, from different places around San Antonio, uh, to really come through with this and to really get out of what we are facing, we're going to have to strip away all those identifiers that divide us. And uh, I hope we can do a better job uh, coming together and finding out and maybe learning things about our community that we've never learned before because uh, of this time of reflection and being at home. So uh, guys, just remember that our faith is all about love and that's what, that's what it's really all about. And that's what we try to promote at Pub Theology above all else. And that comes from all different beliefs and faiths and lifestyles. So again, defend friends. The Friendly Spot, we'll be back there soon-ish. and But until then, we'll stay at home, right? Churches, please stay at home as well and gather in online spaces until we get the green light uh, to meet again. Uh, again, next week, we'll be with pastor and author Max Licato here at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night, April 8th. Guys, have a blessed evening. And you can always watch this video again uh, when this live stream is over. Becca, thank you. Brady, thank you. Have a good night.